Hi there, I'm Lindsay Sparks, author of books that include hidden worlds and twisted myths. Welcome to my weekly Author's Notes podcast. Today is Monday, March 21st, and I would love to share some of my reflections from this past week with you. As usual, uh, the freebies have not changed in the past, like, months, multiple months. Um, so we still have Echo in Time, which is free through all ebook retailers, and then um, all of my first in series um, that have multiple books in a series are free for my newsletter subscribers. And um, the audiobooks of Echo and Time, Inkwitch, and Legacy of the Lost are also free for newsletter subscribers. Um, and the link to join the newsletter and gain access to my starter library is in the show notes. Okay, so currently I am working on um, still the same things, um, just further along. I am, we're eight days away from the release of Song of Scarabs and Fallen Stars, um, which is the first book in the Fateless Trilogy, which is the third series in the Echo world after Echo, the Echo Trilogy and the Cat Dubois Chronicles. Um, so almost a week away. Um, it's next Tuesday that it comes out. I'm so excited for the release. I have so many of the like little final launch prep things to do, which I'll tell you about later. Um, so this is not going to be like a super write, writing, revising week. It's going to be more of like a, it's the business side of the book publishing business, I guess. It's, it's just going to be very businessy this week for me but that's okay. Um, I knew that going into this. I always know that going into a launch. Um, so, um, I am still of also revising Blood of the Broken, which is the fifth Atlantis legacy book. Um, I am on chapter eight of that one. I am reading, this is kind of fun. I am actually reading right now. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I'm reading, um, Song of Scarabs and Fallen Stars, which I'm reading through looking for audiobook pronunciation, um, things, terms that I need to give, um, my narrators, cause I have multiple narrators, the pronunciation guide. And I told them they would have that on the 24th. So I'm just going through the paperback proof looking for, um, that stuff. I'm also looking just fine tooth comb, making sure there's nothing. If there is anything that has slipped past my editor and my proofreader, I'm trying to find those things. And I'm also looking for like fun dialogue pieces that I can use on TikTok or Instagram reels, um, to help promote the book. So that's what I'm reading, um, Song of Scarabs and Fallen Stars for. Um, but it's really hard cause I keep just getting sucked into it and just reading it. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess that's a good thing, but, um, not good, not good for my productivity and accomplishing the tasks that I have set out for myself. <laughs> um, I am also reading via audiobook Zodiac Academy, the first book, The Awakening by Susan Valenti or Suzanne Valenti, I'm not sure, and Caroline Peckham. Um, and there are a couple of po popular, Zodiac Academy is really popular on TikTok. It's um, like a, right now it's really striking me as like a grown up, Harry Potter, like college age Harry Potter, um, kind of like how, um, the magicians was, but much more, I mean, the, it, it focuses on a pair of twin sisters. So it's more female focused. Um, and it seems like it's going to be more romancy. I'm pretty sure it's extremely romancy, a little spicy. So I, I feel like that was part of the reason that I started it. So I'm hoping it doesn't let me down. I do right now. There's a really annoying to me, it's just not my preference. Um, I don't like bully stuff. So this, um, been very bully ish. And I have readers who assure me that, um, that doesn't last forever and that it's worth it if I can get past that part. So I'm hoping that they're not going to let me down. <laughs> um, we are watching right now. We finished the last season of billions and, um, we are now watching severance, um, which is on Apple TV. Um, which we signed up for just so we could watch this, um, cause it looked really good. And then I think we'll watch Ted Lasso probably starting tonight because we finished all of the episodes that are out of severance, which was really good a total mind trip. There's only six episodes out currently. And it, I think it said it's nine episodes in the first season and it's already been renewed for a second season, which is great, but it is just this, the whole concept of this is that these people work for this tech company. I think it's a tech company. We don't really know what the company does, um, called Lumen and they work on a, what's called a severed floor. So that the people who work on that floor are all supposed to have the, have had this procedure that causes it so that, um, when they enter into their workspace, um, their work 
personality takes over. And then when they leave their workspace, um, their personal personality takes over. And those two personalities never cross. So to the work personality, it's like they never leave work in their mind, I guess. They don't know. They don't share any memories. There's no crossover. Anyway, super interesting. Um, Very like near future. I mean, it feels like present day ish. Sometimes it feels kind of 80s ish. I don't know. It's weird, but I'm pretty sure it's present day because they have smartphone smartphones. Um, But it's um, a little bit like sci fi dystopian kind of black mirror esque, I would say very black mirror esque. Um, But but not like a different it's not an anthology. It's like a, a, the same storyline through the whole thing. Um, yeah. So I'm really, I've no, we're my, my husband and I have been speculating what exactly is going on. Um, so we're really curious to see what actually happens. Definitely has captured our attention. And okay. So my high, I don't have a low this week, which is kind of nice. Um, very nice. Uh, my high this week, at least no new lows. So that's good. Uh, my high this week is I have two, two highs. Um, one is, um, I got the paperback proof of Song of Scarabs and Fallen Stars. I don't have it out here. I have it inside cause I'm reading it, um, to go through and look for the pronunciation guide and some quotes. Um, but it's beautiful. There's just a couple things I need to tweak on that. Yeah. And I'm just keeping an eye out if there's anything else I need to tweak as I go through it. And then, um, I also, this last weekend, um, on Saturday night, I went away for just a short little ladies trip with, um, one of my best friends and it was so much fun and so so strange to be away from my children um because that never happens um and but also like very blissful to be 100% in charge of my time <laughs> and not have like nobody needed anything from me which was really really nice um but I did miss I missed my kids like crazy so it's good to be home one night was one night was enough And then let's see here. So last week's obsession, I would say I'm saying is vinyl stickers and I'm going to explain that. So not in that, like I was just like hoarding vinyl stickers or anything like that. But I, um, when we were on our little trip, um, there were all these little, we went specifically to somewhere that has, it's a small town, but they have lots of like cute, it's a little bit touristy. They have a lot of cute little shops and gift shops and, um, just fun, fun, little bakery and bookshops and stuff like that. And we, um, there were uh, so many of them had all these little, like little baskets randomly strewn about the stores, um, of vinyl, cute vinyl stickers, just with funny sayings and stuff like that. Um, and I know those are super popular. People love to put them on their laptops and their water bottles and all the places. Um, but I was like, Oh, that would be so much fun to do stickers for just like different things that have to do with my books. So, once I'm done with this launch, one of the fun things that I'll work on when I'm not writing um, is putting together, designing, and um, stocking up on some fun vinyl stickers um, that I can include when people uh, order paperback. So I think that'll be really fun. Yeah. Okay. So I do have some wacky Google searches, um, just a couple from last week. And so the first one is radiation. I'm not, okay. I get that this is not actually like a wacky, funny thing, but it is um, interesting. So radiation poisoning is one of the terms I searched for. And this relates to um, where Cora is in uh, Blood of the Broken. Um, so I had to research radiation poisoning and the symptoms of radiation poisoning. Um, I settled on queasiness and nausea as it is one of the early signs of the type of, or the like level intensity of radiation poisoning that at least doesn't immediately kill you, um, but could kill you like you could get be, have nausea for a few hours and you still may not die for a few days. So that worked out perfectly for me. Um, so we've got some radiation poisoning happening. And the other term that I searched for for writing purposes was sci-fi ventilator mask, um, which I, I didn't know what to call it. <laughs> um, but they're on a planet where they're not supposed, they should not be they're, I guess, well, I gave that away. They're in an environment where they should not be breathing the air. And so I needed to figure out just how to make this work. Um, because for other reasons, they also can't use, obviously, Cora's psychic. She usually uses her, like, psychic energy, making forms like a bubble around her head. But that is not an option We're in the current environment. Um, so I had to give them some new Olympian tech. So, um... It's not a ventilator mask. I have learned it is would be called a respirator. 
Um, so they have some cool low profile respirators that they're wearing over their um, mouth and nose. And so I got to figure that out. That was, that was good to know. Okay. So last week's goal, I'm trying to get through these pretty quickly so we can read chapter six, um, of song of scarabs and fallen stars. Um, so last week's goals I've failed spectacularly at pretty spectacularly. Um, so get, get at least seven chapters revised of blood of the broken, which would have been one a day. Obviously I did three chapters, Mm, not even, not even a 50%. But that's okay, because I had a lot of stuff that I had to do um, preparing for the launch of Song of Scarabs and Fallen Stars. And I think I've said this before, but I always underestimate how much little little things, and they all add up, that you have to do when you get ready for a book launch. And especially a book launch that is scheduled and has like a pre-order set up, and there's things you're trying to do um, on a specific calendar date. Uh, So that has kind of taken over most of my work time. And as you know, my work time is super limited already, so... Um, check the Song of Scarabs and Fallen Stars paperback, proof and finalize the interior formatting. That is almost completely done. Um, I'm still trying to figure out one little thing to get it um, approved by the printer. Um, And I have a couple tiny little tweaks that I have found in my read through of the proof that I just want to also tweak slightly. But I had already, already gone through the proof and mostly finalized it. So it is, I I should have it. I'm going to resubmit it today after this, and then hopefully it'll be ready um, in another day or two. And I did not do this at all. Write up the Song of Scarabs and Fallen Stars playlist with scene description. So I still just have the, I just haven't created, I have not put the document together, which is what will be available to newsletter subscribers um, after the book launches, which is each song will have with it, like a little paragraph describing the scene that to me it goes with or the character or whatever kind of theme it, it is tied to in the book. Um, so I need to put that together still. Um, okay. So this week, my goals are, um, the things that I didn't do last week. So I need to do the playlist with scene descriptions and I need to finalize the paperback, um, finalize, finalize. So I already finalized it, but I need to like final, final stamp of approval, like get it in route to being published, um, imminently. I need to finish the pronunciation guide for the audiobook. Um, and I need to lots of little things. These, these are all the little things I need to set out the pre-order for book two, which I want to have that pre-order live just before book one goes live. So when people get book one and want book two, uh, they can order that before they forget about it. Um, and I need to set up some Facebook ads for the launch. And this is the launch is like I said, um, not this, not tomorrow, but next Tuesday. And I would like to, but I'm not like setting this up as a hard goal. Um, if I can revise three chapters of blood of the broken, um, near the end of the week and over the weekend, I should have some mornings when I actually get some writing time. If I, if I have the time, I'd like to do that, but that is like the last thing on my list. Okay. And I am looking forward to, um, just getting the book launch all wrapped up and moving on with my life into the next book, which is always what it is onward to the next book. (laughs) So, um, let us go ahead and move into, um, the reading of, Uh, continuing Song of Scarabs and Fallen Stars, the preview. So last week I read chapter five, which was Lex's first chapter. And this week I am reading chapter six, which is Kat's first chapter. So here we go. Uh, Song of Scarabs and Fallen Stars, chapter six, Cat. Lips pursed into a permafrown, I flipped a fourth card from the deck of tarot cards, adding it to the three cards already laid face up, on the small patch I had cleared on the dining room table, on the dining table in front of me. Half finished sketches lay scattered around the tarot cards, the fruits of a brief but productive manic drawing session. Scowling at the partial tarot spread, I took a gulp of whiskey, breakfast of champions, then set my empty glass down with thunk. I flipped another card, the motion jerkier, um, oh, I should probably like give a language warning. This is a cat chapter, which means it is um, not safe for non-adult ears or work. Yeah, not safe, not safe for work. Bad language and some mild adult content, I guess. <laughs> Motherfucker, I muttered. 
I flipped another card and slapped it down. Motherfucking motherfucker! When I flipped the next card, I didn't even bother laying it in the spread on the table with the others. I held it pinched between my fingers and glared at the image displayed on its face. The tarot card quivered. The star card displayed Tarset, nude, kneeling at the edge of a pool of water surrounded by palm trees and sand, arms extended over the pool and water dripping from her cupped hands. Seven stars hung above her in the twilight sky, looking like silver asterisks. Near the horizon, in the place of an eighth star, a black scarab hovered, its wings flared up and around its wings flared up and around a golden disc. Upright this card represented hope and creativity, which seemed fitting for Tarset. But upside down, as the card kept appearing, the star suggested loneliness and defeat. The spread of cards was the same as before, the same as always. The silence filling the cabin grated on my nerves. The endless falling snow outside muffled all the noise of the surrounding world, a world that had become far too quiet. We may have vanquished the enemy, but they had left brutal scars on the earth. Growling, I unleashed my frustration on the useless tarot cards, shoving them off the table with a violent sweep of my arm. Several sheets of paper fluttered to the hardwood floor, covering some of the cards. With a harsh scream, I shoved my chair back and stood partway. Another angrier arm sweep sent more sketches flying, along with my empty whiskey glass and a few discarded pens. The glass smacked against a cabinet door, then rolled on its side down the length of the aisle between the kitchen island and the row of cabinets. A couple of sheets of print, a couple sheets of paper made it all the way to the rug in the living room beyond the far end of the table. Breathing hard, I leaned forward, my palms planted on the table's smooth oak surface. I had been raw and on edge since that final showdown with the netjares, like the colossal force I had channeled had overloaded my synapses and singed my nerve endings. The smallest things set me off these days, and the most minute use of my powers exhausted me. Nick had brought me here, to this cabin in the remote Alaskan wilderness, to give me a chance to recuperate in peace. I had no idea what was going on out there in the rest of the world, though I supposed I would find out today when we met with the Netjer clan leader when we met with the Nejaret clan leaders at the oasis. It would be my first time revisiting the scene of the battle. I straightened and reached out to my right to snatch the half full whiskey bottle off the end of the counter. I yanked the stopper free, took a long pull of the burning amber liquid, then stuffed the stopper back into the neck of the bottle. Rage bubbled up, boiling over. With a hoarse howl, I chucked the bottle across the cabin. It hurtled toward the picture window in the living room. I hadn't actually intended to throw the bottle at it, but that's where it was headed, and part of me gleefully anticipated the impending explosion of glass. The bottle froze, feet from smashing into, and likely through, the window. It hovered in front of the glass, the idyllic winter wonderland displayed beyond, remaining undisturbed by my tantrum. A delicate vine of iridescent ought coiled around the neck of the bottle, the other end of the vine rooted in the floor. In the entryway beyond the corner of the living room, the cabin's front door stood open. Nick stepped inside, holding an armful of fighter... Nick stepped inside holding an armful of firewood, his tall, imposing figure framed by a serene, snowy backdrop. The early morning light tinted the snow behind him rose gold. He had been out since I woke up some forty minutes ago. Now I knew where he'd been, chopping wood. Sometimes he needed physical activity to expel his frustration. I wasn't oblivious enough to think I wasn't the root source of most of that frustration. Nick stomped his boots on the entry rug and scanned the chaos on the floor around the table before fixing his attention on the hovering bottle. A grim expression hardened his stunning, angular features. At his direction, the ot vine lowered the whiskey bottle, gently setting it on an end table beside the couch. The thin vine unwound from around the neck of the bottle and withdrew, fizzling away in a glittering mist. Nick took another step into the cabin and kicked the front door shut. I thought we talked about this, kitty cat. He speared me with his pale blue stare, one eyebrow elevated. It would seem you and I have different definitions of the word rest. 
I raised my right hand, thrust it out in front of me, and flipped in the bird. The corner of Nick's sinful mouth tensed, and he narrowed his eyes to irritated slits. In the same heartbeat, a new vine of aught snuck up from the, har- from the floorboards at my feet and snaked around my outstretched wrist. Nick tutted and shook his head. Such crude manners. Somebody should really teach you a lesson. My stomach did a little flip-flop at the dark promise in his words. I tugged my arm, attempting to pull free from the vine's hold, but it was useless, like being cuffed in an iron manacle. Before that final no-holds-barred battle with the net jars, I easily would have been able to shatter the ot vine with focused thought. But at the moment, the task was utterly impossible. Nick crossed the living room to the oversized hearth in the far wall, taking his time, letting me struggle. He crouched and set down the firewood, stacking it in a neat little pyramid in the recessed cubby beside the fireplace. By the time he stood and faced me, I had stopped struggling. I couldn't break free, not in my current state. I assumed that was the whole point of his little display of power, and my lack thereof. Nick wanted me to face my weakened state, to acknowledge the lingering effects of the battle. The war was over, but the trauma from the fight lingered in my body, in my soul. Nick crossed his arms over his chest and stood in front of the hearth, simply staring at me. His eyes trailed lazily down the length of my body, taking in the baggy sweats and t-shirt I had taken from his dresser when I crawled out of bed. When his gaze finally returned to mine, his pale eyes glinted dangerously. "'Since you seem to be incapable of resting on your own,' he said, slowly stalking toward me. He unzipped his checked wool coat and shrugged out of it, shedding his lumberjack disguise and tossing the coat aside like it contained the last shreds of his civility. "'It falls to me to make you rest.' I gulped, a zing of anticipation shooting down my spine, striking my core. I licked my lips, my chest rising and falling faster than before. Another vine of aught shot out of the floor and captured my other wrist. Those twin vines holding me captive pulled my hands down and dragged me backward toward my abandoned chair. When the back of my right calf hit the wooden chair leg, two more ot vines burst up from the floor and coiled around my ankles, climbing up my calves and around my knees. They forced my knees to bend and and I resisted for only a few seconds before dropping into the chair. As soon as I sat, the vines holding my limbs latched onto the arms and legs of the chair, restraining me. I instinctively struggled against my bindings, but by the time Nick reached me, I had fallen still. His heated, hyper-focused gaze ro- roved. His heated, hyper-focused gaze roved up and down my body. He was hunger, need, desire, and he was just a little bit scary. I watched him, motionless, save for the rapid rise and fall of my chest. I had a rough idea of where this was headed, but Nick could be extremely creative. I could only imagine what he had planned for me. The only thing I knew for sure was that I would love every damn second of it. Nick leaned in, looming over me. He set his hands on the arms of my chair, directly behind my elbows, and bent his arms, sinking deeper into my personal space. A low, rough noise rumbled in his chest as he nuzzled the hollow of my neck, his nose barely skimming that sensitive flesh. The aught vines twining around my legs crept higher, inching up the insides of my thighs. They forced my knees apart. They forced my knees further apart until the outsides of my legs were flush against the chair's armrests. Nick pulled back enough that I could see his achingly beautiful face. His gaze skimmed over my features, dark lust burning in his pale irises. His face was naked of his signature piercings, but his neck displayed the goddess Isis tattoo. But his neck displayed the goddess Isis, tattooed in black ink, her wings outstretched to embrace him. I had done that, marked him. My ink stained patches of his skin, all over his glorious body. A small, possessive smile curved my lips. You want me to punish you, don't you? Nick said, his voice a low purr. His attention lingered on my lips before returning to my eyes. 
Do you want pain or pleasure? He licked his lips as they curved into a slow, wicked grin. Or both. I... My voice caught in my throat, my heart hammering and my whole body flushing. Don't get me wrong. My sexual tastes were far from vanilla. But Nick was every other fucking flavor in the ice cream shop, and he made me feel like an inexperienced young virgin at least once a day. I want... But Nick's focus abruptly strayed away from me, and my words faltered. He fell still, absolutely and completely. Even his ought vines ceased their slow, incessant creep up my body. I watched as the desire bled from his eyes, as his eyelids opened wider, as something that looked a hell of a lot like fear took root in his shocked stare. What? I craned my neck to see what had captured his attention. Something on the floor. But all that was down there were my scattered tarot cards and the dozens of half-finished, hastily sketched drawings. Straining the muscles and tendons in my neck, I glanced from Nick to the drawing I thought had captured his attention and back. What is it? The ot vines restraining me vanished, leaving me startlingly free to move. I twisted my wrists, increasing the blood flow to my fingers. Nick stepped away from my chair and crouched to pick up the sketch. He stood and extended his arm, holding the sketch out in front of me. What is this? I scanned the drawing. It was one of the first I had done this morning. Like all the others, it featured a winged scarab holding a circle over its head in its buggy pincers, much like the scarab on the star card. Aesthetically, this particular rendition of the winged scarab was very much in the style of the ancient Egyptians. It's a drawing, I said dryly. Duh. Nick didn't react to the sarcasm dripping from those three words. It wasn't like him to ignore my pokes and prods. He liked it when I gave him shit, and he enjoyed dishing it back out even more. Unease settled in my belly, replacing the need Nick had stoked just moments ago. Nick locked eyes with me. Why did you draw this, cat? The paper shivered as he shook the drawing for emphasis. He called me cat. Not kitty cat, just cat. This was bad. My brow furrowed and my lips parted. Again, I looked from Nick to the drawing and back. I searched his eyes, trying to understand why this sketch had shaken him so badly. I didn't get it. I was trying to find Tarset, I admitted. He was going to love that, especially after I had promised not to even try to use my powers when I was alone. Lately, I had a bad habit of ending up unconscious when I pushed myself too hard, magically speaking. A bitter laugh bubbled up from my chest, and I flung a hand, gesturing to the rest of the unfinished sketches littering the floor. Each displayed some variation of the same scarab symbol in different artistic styles. Clearly I'm broken, I added, my shoulders slumping as I lowered my arm. I give up. You win. No more powers. I'll rest. Nick ignored my admission of defeat, which was unlike him. His eyes remained locked on the drawing in his hand. Do you know what this represents? His gaze flickered up, meeting mine for a fleeting moment before returning to the sketch. This symbol? I shook my head, frowning as I studied the drawing more closely. I mean, other than the sun, right? That's what the scarab is holding? The sun? At Nick's minute nod, I continued. So maybe it represents Ra or Amun or another of the divine manifestations of the sun? Nick finally tore his stare away from the drawing. His eyes locked with mine once more. Tum, he said, naming one of those solar gods. It represents Tum. I shook my head slowly, willing, unwilling or unable to make the necessary mental leap quickly as fear iced through my veins. Tum was a Nezaret myth, a legend. He was our version of the boogeyman, said to hunt naughty Nezarets and kill them in their sleep. And I had drawn his symbol over and over while trying to find Tarset. I swallowed roughly, but I cleared my throat and held Nick's haunted stare. But Atum is a myth. He's not real. Yeah, sure, Nick said, but despite his quick agreement, his voice lacked conviction. 
Whatever you say, kitty cat. Okay, that's it for chapter six of Song of Scarabs and Fallen Stars. I will read chapter seven um, next Monday, the day before the book releases. So um, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Um, And I'll be back next week to ramble some more and to read chapter seven. Until then, happy reading.